Perfect. All right. Well, yeah, thank you, Mary, for that presentation. And as she mentioned, I'm presenting some of my research on the average needs protection to society, which was a indigenous rights organization in London, England, throughout most of the 19th and, and some of the 20th century. And when I started researching the Aborigines Protection Society, I carried a, a set of assumptions about the nature of their relationship with settlers in the British settler colonies. And my assumptions were based off of very provocative statements that appear in settler newspapers. Like one of my favorites is on the top here from Sydney Morning Herald, which says that the Aborigines Protection Society are a pack of conceited blockheads and their noble chairman, a twaddling busybody. And these types of statements are very common and they led me to expect and many other historians to, to conclude that either settlers did not write letters to the Aborigines Protection Society very often, or if they did, they would have written fairly negatively. But what I actually found was the complete opposite. I actually found that uh, in the period I'm studying, which is the late 19th century, settlers actually wrote far more often than missionaries who are traditionally assumed to be the, the society's main correspondents. And you can see in this brief table that almost twice as many settlers wrote in this period and almost four times as many settlers as indigenous peoples, which I won't be discussing today. That's a different chapter in my thesis. And far from... Uh, writing negatively to the society, I found that settlers implored the society for assistance in seeking justice for Indigenous peoples in their local communities. And one of the main forms of assistance they asked for was help publishing letters to the editor in British newspapers, usually after multiple attempts of trying to publish letters themselves and facing rejection, or sometimes they just faced uh, self-confidence issues and assumed they would never get published. So they would send their letters to the society first. And you can see some of their language in these quotes. And I'll read the top one that uh, one person from Cape Colony wrote, publish these passages in English papers that the public may know how serious is the state of affairs here. And these types of comments recur and recur and recur sometimes more than 10 times from the same person over a 10 year span. And so my proposal in this presentation is that this preoccupation that I've identified with settlers uh, raising uh, public awareness in British newspapers re reveals some, some interesting implications about settler colonialism uh, as a structure. And I'm speaking specifically about the period roughly 1860s to 1890s, uh, when settler colonialism as a structure was becoming more and more entrenched in the settler colonies. Uh, some typical examples of this new structure are changing ideas of race from earlier ideas of shared humanity or relatively equal British subjecthood to new faiths in inherent racial difference and much talked about logics of elimination and containment. And also it was during this period that most of the settler colonies either had just recently obtained some form of self-government in the form of responsible government, or they were about to obtain responsible government. And they were using their new powers to enact increasingly racialized legislation. Uh, in Canada, some of the more famous infamous laws are the the uh, I wrote Graduate Civilization Act. I meant Gradual Civilization Act. Um, but these sorts of, sort of laws came about at a very similar period, swiftly after self-government in almost all of the settler colonies. But the settlers who wrote to the Aborigines Protection Society and tried to publish these letters in the British press rejected these developments. And in this presentation, I'm going to just survey three case studies of such settlers and pick out this very peculiar commonality I've identified in them, where each of them used their letters to the British press as a way to escape what they, they perceived to be disinformation and censorship in their local settler newspapers. Uh, 
And I'll follow up my presentation with some historiographical commentary, but I'm really first gonna dive into my primary sources and start uh, by introducing you to these case studies. So on the left, you'll see Octavius Hadfield, who was the Archdeacon of Kapiti, just north of Wellington, New Zealand. And he wrote to the Times, the Morning Herald and the Morning Post about the first Taranaki War in 1860 to 61, which was just uh, essentially that the New Zealand government purchased 600 acres of land from the Te Yatiawa Maori uh, from one person and completely ignored the overlapping land rights of the many people who held rights to that land, leading to uh, a year or more of very intense guerrilla warfare. That was pretty humiliating for the British military. In the middle, you'll see Philip Carpenter, who was a conchologist and lectured at McGill College in Montreal, Quebec. And he wrote to uh, the Daily Telegraph and the Daily News in 1875 about some land disputes between the Mohawk of Ganesetake and the Seminary of Saint-Sulpice, just west of Montreal, which that, that dispute traced back to 1717 when the French king granted land rights to the seminary for Kanasatake without the consultation or consent of the Mohawk. And then in the 19th century, when the Mohawk began converting to Methodism, the seminary turned actively hostile against them. And in 1875, led to the seminary tearing down the Mohawk's church. And that's what Philip wrote about. And on the right, you'll see Harold Stevens, who you'll, you'll see a picture of many zebra and men one of them is Harold Stevens. I've not yet identified which one, but he was a lawyer in Kimberley, the diamond capital of the Cape Colony. And he wrote to the Standard as well as the Times about uh, hostilities in the 1880s between the Transvaal state, the Afrikaner Transvaal, and the Swana of modern day Botswana, which the simple story behind that was the Transvaal wanted to extend onto the territory of the Swana, but they didn't want to do it openly because that risked war with Britain. So they spread this propaganda that uh, it was rogue citizens doing the warfare and not the Transvaal state. And Harold Stevens was writing about those conflicts. So these are very three very different manifestations of settler colonialism. But as I'm going to demonstrate, they share this very interesting pattern of frustration with local settler newspapers at what you could say about Indigenous rights and moving beyond settler papers to the British press to perform uh, humanitarian activism. So for Octavius Hadfield, that really meant opposing pro-war rhetoric in the New Zealand press. Uh, the New Zealand newspapers, they were divided to some extent over whether it's just to steal 600 acres of land by force or not. But all the newspapers in New Zealand uh, agreed that a decisive punishing victory was necessary over the Maori to establish British sovereignty. Uh, they, they believed in some conspiracy theories that the war was about preventing all future land sales and pushing the British, the, the colonists into the sea. And so, it doesn't appear in pretty much any New Zealand newspaper an idea that maybe the war is not a good thing uh, or that maybe we should stop and surrender. No, there's no idea like that, except Octavius Hatfield, who wrote to the Times in London uh, with completely opposite ideas. He argued that the, the Maori were actually fighting for British sovereignty. And he explained that it's a curious but an important feature of the present war that the, the Maori regard themselves as fighting in support of law and order in opposition to the illegal conduct of Governor Brown. And Octavius also disagreed that the war should be continued to seek a decisive punishing victory. He instead argued that the war had to be surrendered as quickly as possible, telling the Times that Nothing is more certain than the whole white population of this island would be exterminated so soon as the War of Maori extermination began in good earnest. And so I'll dig deeper into the context of this, but what I find so fascinating about these letters 
is they contain ideas that just don't appear in the New Zealand newspapers at the time, uh, which hints towards this pattern of moving settler humanitarianism out of the local press community and into the imperial press community. For Philip Carpenter over in Montreal, uh, it was more about the lack of coverage of seminary persecutions against the Mohawk at Kanasatake. So the seminary of saint sulpice throughout 1875 conducted a series of persecutions uh, against the Mohawk, none of which were reported in the New Zealand, or sorry, in the uh, Montreal press. Uh, until like one, one newspaper, the Montreal Witness did start reporting them and the Bishop of Montreal banned the newspaper and threatened to withhold the Holy Sacraments from anyone who read this newspaper. So, uh, and that silence continued until December when the Mohawk church was pulled down, as you'll see in this little engraving. But even then, the Montreal newspapers reported this, but they completely defended the seminary, arguing that since they held the legal land rights that were granted in 1717, they could do whatever they wanted on their property. And Philip Carpenter, our conchologist, in his own words, boiled with English indignation. And he wrote to uh, these, uh, this is from the Telegraph, uh, trying to spread awareness of what the seminary was doing. He told the, the Telegraph that the seminary priests are beginning downright persecutions. For trifles, the poor men are hauled up before the magistrate and heavily fined and imprisoned. Their wood is cut down and sold. They're driven from their houses and no one knows what will come next. So he was using the British press to break this censorship, this silence around what was happening to the Mohawk. And he also challenged the logic that you can use property rights to uh, justify injustice. And he wrote to the Telegraph that should not be allowed or should not be reasonable to destroy a church which was erected on land which Indian families have possessed unchallenged for many generations. And so Philip Carpenter's case is sort of continuing on this uh, pattern of anger with his local newspapers at the disinformation he believed they were spreading and using the British press and participatory journalism in letters to the editor to challenge that perceived disinformation. And Harold Stevens is my third case to bring this home. He, writing from Kimberley in the Cape Colony, uh, was angry about the Kimberley newspapers, which completely refused to recognize that the Transvaal state was responsible for the wars in Botswana, modern day Botswana. The Kimberley newspapers completely supported and bought into the Transvaal state's propaganda that it was rogue citizens responsible for the war and it wasn't, it wasn't a government backed uh, campaign. But the Kimberley newspapers also uh, dis disavowed or uh, absolved the Transvaal of responsibility by blaming the Swana for the wars. Uh, blaming one chief, Mampur, saying that he was destroyed by his own folly. And another chief, Mapok, they said he, uh, he richly deserved what he got. So they were absolving the, the, the Transvaal. And Harold Stevens responded by writing to the Standard in London with a scathing indictment of the Transvaal state's complicity. This one he wrote that, it suits the Boer government to make out that they have nothing to do with the war. They're careful not to do it in an official way because that might cause trouble with England. Whereas by aiding and assisting it privately, they could do quite as much without incurring responsibility. And as to these comments in the Kimberley press that it was the, the Swanna's fault for the, their destruction, he says that saying this is a disgrace to the white inhabitants of South Africa and to civilization so-called in general. So these are very different contexts, very, they're decades apart, worlds apart, and the contexts matter. Octavius Hatfield was writing in a moment of settler precarity. He honestly was afraid that the colony was in jeopardy and he saw humanitarianism as a means of securing his own future. Philip Carpenter, writing in 1875 Montreal, 
didn't really have that context. For him, his letters are laced with anti-Catholicism. And he saw uh, humanitarianism as a marker of his Britishness on British honor both against French dishonor, as he perceived it, but also American dishonor. He was very uh, careful to, to differentiate himself from Americans. And Harold Stevens, writing in mid-80s uh, in Africa, was writing in the context of the scramble for Africa. And in, in his letters, he connected humanitarianism with securing trade routes into Central Africa. But despite these huge differences in their contexts, they have this very interesting pattern of subverting what they believe to be censorship of indigenous perspectives or support for indigenous peoples and going to a higher level, going to the British press through letters to the editor to perform their humanitarianism. And to finish up, I have some reflections on some of the significance this has for the historiography of settler colonialism. Uh, so of colonial studies as a discipline, a subdiscipline, more like, especially represented by Lorenzo Berchini, uh, has identified this triangular relationship of indigenous peoples, the metropole, and settlers, where, for example, indigenous peoples would move between their uh, claims to um, whether it be Britishness, British subjectivity, or to their treaties with Britain to oppose settler politics, whereas settlers would try to use their um, alleged uh, expertise of indigenous peoples to disprove metropolitan humanitarianism. So all three of these groups move between each other according to this model. And historians have used settler newspapers as evidence of this model. Alan Lester, 20 years ago, uh, pointed out that in the early and mid 19th century, settler newspaper editors crafted their articles and their editorials to, to do exactly this, to represent and establish their knowledge of indigenous peoples, to disprove the and invalidate metropolitan humanitarians and prove their ability to self-govern. Uh, Kenton's story, writing about the 1860s, identified that settler newspapers uh, appropriated humanitarian discourses to uh, justify distinctly anti-humanitarian policies. And Sam Hutchinson, writing in the about the late 19th century, argued that settler newspapers uh, engaged in humanitarian discourses to absolve themselves of guilt for colonial violence and to disavow the existence of those foundational colonial violence. But what this pattern that I'm sort of looking at is that all of these arguments have an assumption that settler newspapers reflect to some extent settler society. But what I'm starting to see is that they're very curated to show some specifically uh, anti-humanitarian ideas and that settlers who are more aligned with humanitarianism felt censored, felt that it didn't re represent their, their opinions. And the, actually I see this, this uh, triangle represented except in the opposite direction. I found that these settlers used their connection to the metropole, to the British press, to try to support indigenous people. So same triangle, just different direction that many historians have identified. And this also has some implications for imperial humanitarianism in general. Uh, I won't go one by one through these, but humanitarianism is generally represented by historians as a distinctly metropolitan and missionary uh, activity that is in some ways antithetical to the settler colonial project. But what I'm starting to think about, and I'm going to leave this presentation with the question that's currently on my head in my brain, is that we know that settler colonialism is founded upon the erasure and disavowal of indigenous voices and histories. But what if it's also uh, founded upon the marginalization or censorship of settler humanitarians? And if so, how did settler colonialism as a structure deal with settler humanitarians? Did it censor all of them? 
or did it somehow incorporate their critique to support itself? And I think that once we start answering some of those questions, we'll have a more better idea of how Southern colonialism as a structure withheld in internal critique and not just external critique. And that's all I have for you. Thank you very much. <laughs>